I'm Michael Spencer, and I work at Sony PlayStation. And I want to explain uh, how compilers use some exceptions. And the reason for this is that there have been uh, quite a few uh, blog posts and, and discussions online about, about exceptions performance and size and how they affect things. And they'll go and do a bunch of uh, benchmarks over either micro benchmarks or, or taking like arbitrary programs and doing some modification to them. And when they get to the analysis stage of the remarks, there's, there's not, generally not much there uh, because they, they, they make guesses about what the compiler is doing or, or it's most, mostly just uh, guesses. And I wanted to do something to, to help people doing the, these uh, analyses or analyses. Uh, actually, so first I did have a question. Uh, how many people here at the the main thing that you work on with C++, how many of you have exceptions turned off? One, two, three? Yes. The no. most, most of it. Two and a half. Right. So only three. That's a, I'm actually, I'm a little bit surprised. Um, <laughs> although mainly it's most people here to be angry at it if I say that they're slow. But um, So do any of you want to share why you have them turned off? Because you've been told to shut them by, you. by me, wow. me personally. <laughs> yeah. I, I can stand in for Odin. I otherwise have them turned off. But Odin says exceptions, I can't use them because the tables are too big to fit on my flash. So the comment was that the, the tables are too big to fit, fit on his flash. And the other common reason is that uh, there's, uh, people claim that they're slow. Uh, Actually, my programmers don't know how to use that, that, that also is the case. Programmers not knowing how to use them. I would say uh, another answer is um, I'm a C programmer. You're asking me to do C++ and exceptions? No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, so the comment was that I'm a C programmer, and you're asking me to do C++ and exceptions at the same time. This is too much, too much going on. So what are exceptions? Um, <laughs> like try, catch, throw. But, but what is it really? It's, it's just two things. It's implicit control flow. So control flow that you don't see, there's no ifs. And thread local data. Uh, your exception state, the thing that you're throwing, is just thread local data. So what do you mean by implicit control flow? So you have your function here. It's really simple. You construct an object, call a external function, you construct another object, call a external function. Maybe your destructor is, is logging or doing something special here. And uh, this is what you type in. And, but that's not really what the compiler sees. Uh, what the compiler sees is actually this. And we have the special thing, like this is not valid C++, but it's representing what the compiler is seeing. Uh, this is just a go-to. So it says that when you call external, if it returns normally, then you just continue on. However, if an exception gets thrown, you actually need to unwind down here and then call the destructors and then continue throwing. And if you fail here, you need to call both B and A. So this is what the compiler is actually reasoning about when it looks at your code. So we also have thread local data. And you can actually observe this, like std current exception, it gets the current exception for your current thread. And each thread of execution can only have a single exception in flight. And less, well, like you can't. Like the attaining ABI actually like supports chaining exceptions, but nothing uses it. Uh, Except you can, while one is in flight in a destructor, throw another thing as long as it gets caught before the destructor leaves. There could be multiple ones in flight. Just one is on top of this. It, it, one is the top one. In flight. So you can do that because of the way that catches work. Like uh, I'll, I'll get into how the, the it's actually implemented and why it works that way. Um, but only one can be unwinding at a time. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's that's slightly different. Though. It it is. Uh, yeah. So how are they implemented? Uh, there there are two main implementations. Um, at first, we had set jump and long jump. Uh, so what set jump and long jump do is you can save the state of your program, uh, the the execution state, like the, the registers and what instruction set you're, uh, what instruction pointer you're at, and then later anywhere in your program you can long jump to that. And there's a lot of rules about when you can do this, but this is how things were originally implemented. Then later came table based exception handling. So we'll take a brief look at set jump and long jump. And the way this works is that the compiler inserts code 
to maintain a linked list of contexts. And so when you enter a function, if it potentially needs to clean anything up, it'll add itself to a thread local uh, linked list and go call set jump and add it there. And then uh, they, they remove them at the end of the function. And when you unwind an exception, you just call long jump. And you have some extra state set. And when you reach the set jump, it checks and sees what was your state. Are you returning because um, uh, there, there's different kinds of unwinds? And so do I need to clean up? Am I going to catch the exception? It does it not match my handlers. But that turned out to be slow because you've got, you're maintaining a linked list on every function call. So next was table-based EH and specifically GCC style. Uh, Microsoft also has a table-based exception handling implementation, and it is, uh, um, in principle, equivalent, uh, or it's a similar style. Th there are quite a few differences. And we do, don't actually reference the Xenthum the same way in LLVM, but ends up similar. So the goal of table-based exception handling was to stop tracking state in the happy path. So you've got your, your handling disappointment and, and, and happy. So let's, let's stop doing work in the happy path. But that state needs to go somewhere, and so it ends up in tables. Specifically, the EH frame and GCC set tables. <coughs> let's take a look at EH frame. What this does is it describes how to walk the stack. Um, we're not saving all the register state into like onto the stack somewhere. And so we need to, it needs to know what registers were they in, what stack slots things get saved in, so that it can find the return address and continue walking up the stack or return uh, resume state there. However, these are also actually used for asynchronous unwind is the term for it, but it's actually backtraces. So when you like do backtrace in GCC, it actually, or GDB, it needs to read these. So these are actually here even if you turn off exceptions. And they're required by the ABI, but in practice, you can remove them if you have no exceptions, and things will work. Uh, but these don't actually say what happens with, with when exceptions are thrown. All it says is how to walk the stack. Uh, and these are structured. And so uh, I felt it was actually important to show the way that these are structured because of the way that we are restricted in emitting code later. Um, I'm not going to go into su super de detail. It's just you have. For each object file, for each translation unit, you get a block of data. And then for each function, you get a entry in a table. And what that says is uh, what instruction range that refers to and how to restore the stack, the, the program state, at that, uh, in that function. And then because it would be slow to look at the whole list every time, do a linear scan, we build a binary lookup table. So whenever you, you start doing a backtrace, you first go look at the uh, binary search table, go look at that data, read a bunch of dwarf, decode a bunch of things. And this also actually does have a pointer to something called the language-specific data area, which basically just pointing to the actual C++ exception information. So for the other table, we, we need to actually describe what happens when you're walking the stack. And for each call, we describe what cleanup code to execute and what catch clauses to match. And so this is another big section. This, for each call site, we say, what's the range of this call site? Where do we go? And what do we do? And so points to a linked list of action records, which says, which types am I handling? Or am I cleaning up? And then that points to like std type info. So you also need RTTI for exceptions. Uh, with no exceptions, you can also disable RTTI, or runtime type information. So how does a compiler actually represent this? Uh, branches. That's how exceptions get represented. So let's take a look at this code. I grabbed this off of um, uh, CPP reference. How many branches does this code have? What do I mean? How many conditional branches, more specifically? One. Is it? Is it? So it could be one. Like in the actual code, we only see one. Um, any any other guesses for for how the compiler is going to look at it? <laughs> so, so it actually turns out that uh, I think it's about like twelve that we hit. 
Um, and the reason, so there's this thing called destructor D. The reason that's there is because if you actually don't need to clean anything up, then it doesn't need to check if it's throwing an exception. Um, but in this case, uh, now is marked no except, so you don't have one there. But every single one of these is more down here. Every single one of those is a conditional branch. In the compiler, doesn't actually make a jump. Um, and even like minus subtract is, is branch. And I think this is also one. Um, and even here, but the compiler is actually kind of smart. We do some work. We figure out you can't throw from here, so clearly this can't fail. So you actually do get quite a few branches. So what does this look like in the compiler? We're actually going to go to a simpler example, because the IR for that one is huge. We're going to go back to our original uh, example, expanded out with the not valid C++, but what the compiler sees. So here's a bunch of IR. I'm actually going to go more in depth um, with a step, with an even smaller example. But the important thing to note here is that these things, each one of these numbered, it's just a label, and it's a basic block. And whenever you start a basic block, the previous thing is a terminator. So it's the last instruction in that, that basic block. Um, and here we have, so in the happy path, we just go to one. We just continue down. And in the sad path, if it's a pointing path, we go down and start doing exception handling. So all of this is exception handling. And this is your happy path. And you'll note that we actually don't have any branches here calling. That was one thing I forgot to change. Pretend that this is, the, is A's destructor. And that's actually because since C++11, uh, destructors are no accept by default. So if you have no accept, then you get, you, you get rid of those branches or the control flow. Um, so we'll get into a bit more detail. Uh, how is try catch implemented? So we'll go to an even smaller example and just look at this line by line. Um, we have, so this is just defining what the function is. It takes, you know, an int, pointer, and an int. And then we have this thing called a personality. Uh, a personality function is what connects the uh, exception, the, the EH table, to the GCC except table, the, the C++ specific tables. Uh, it, the, the unwinder looks at the exception handling table, and then at each frame, depending on the information that's there, it'll call the personality function to figure out what to do. If it should go to the landing, uh, go to the cleanup code, or if it should just continue up. And uh, we mark that there, because it's a single personality for each function. Then we just store some code, x86, if you're more familiar. This is just the two stores. So nothing special there. Now we're going to go and try to call potentially throwing instruction. So here we have an invoke. We're going to call AF. And if we're happy, we're going to go to 18, which we'll see. Which, and if we're happy, actually, so the only thing we're doing is AF. And if that succeeds, we're going to exit the function. So really all AF is, is the, or sorry, 18 is, is the exit block. If we're not happy, then we got to go and clean up. Actually, sorry, we have to go to the catch block. And so what does this look like? Assembly, your happy path is just a call with uh, setting the this pointer and then the call. And then all the tables. Uh, there's actually a bit more to the tables, but this is the important stuff. Um, we have to mark where the call site is, which is just uh, this range. Uh, mark how long it is. And then say what happens. So if we fail, we're going to jump to the cleanup. And we actually have a, a catch clause. So we have some actions we need to perform. This is a linked list. We go to action record number two. Uh, there's some weird, the way they index things is weird. But this just says that it's action record number one. So first, we catch type info one. Type info one is just int. And uh, then you just do the cleanup. But so that's where all the code ended up that would be if you had done uh, return error handling. You would have had call, check the return value, jump to something else. Instead, that gets encoded here. So and if everything's happy, then we destruct A and return. Um, 
but we still get some um, tables here. And here's where we get to start to get to places where compilers can improve. Uh, this is no except. You can't have an exception here. You don't need any tables. Um, but we do. This is where the EH tables come from. Um, they're called CFI directives. There's a bunch of gobbledygook. But uh, whenever we modify the stack, so here we're modifying the stack, we're popping something onto the stack, we need to keep track of where the return address is, because it's moving relative to the stack pointer on these cases. And so that's what gets added for keeping track of that. So let me go to the catch. Here we have a landing pad. So landing pad is what's referred to as what you do when an exceptional um, when an exception happens and you actually need to do something. You, you arrive at a landing pad. And the landing pad gets two things. It gets a pointer to a, uh, the block that contains exception information, and it contains which um, type you are, uh, which type was thrown. And so there's a little bit of magic to extract some data out of that. Then we the, the important part here is that we compare against, if, is this an int? We check if it's an int. And then if it's not, we actually need to just resume the exception. If it is, we uh, call ext. But this just gets lowered down to this. Most of that code disappears. So like if you're looking at your, your IR and you see a bunch of code, this, this, actually, this doesn't turn into a bunch of assembly. It's really just these two things. And we also need to kill, we need to have our catch block. So we have to begin catch, which just gets the current exception. This is equivalent, or almost equivalent to get current exception. We need to load the integer from it and then call the external function. That function can fail. And if that fails, we need to resume exceptions. Um, otherwise, we're done catching and we break out. Um, and this is why the, the comment earlier about multiple in flight exceptions. As soon as you call this, uh, actually, as soon as you land in the landing pad, you're no longer unwinding. Um, and so you can now have a separate exception propagate. And uh, that's why that works. Sorry, uh, this one. Um, again, lowers down, really simple. Um, to begin the catch, end the catch, call ext. And all this says is that if ext fails, then we need to go do some cleanup work. And then the last thing that happens is um, if, so this is, this is the case of if it does fail. Then if, if x throws an exception, we have yet another landing pad. And then we have to clean up A, and then we resume throwing the exception. So we resume propagation, which doesn't get any tables, and just calls and resumes. So now let me know that what the the compiling, sorry, yes. Um, if you have multiple catch blocks that are from multiple landing pads, are yeah. they tried in order, or is there a table that tells you exactly where to go? They are, tr uh, so that is handled, do I have a mouse? Apparently I don't have a mouse. Uh, that is handled in this code. Um, since there's only one, we're just going to omit a single compare. Um, if there's multiple, then it just emits a switch. So it just lowers to a, it can lower to a jump table or just a normal switch. Yep, too far. Where am I? Okay. There we go. So now that we know more about the type of code that the, the compiler has to generate and uh, the, the restrictions on the, the tables, we can start looking at how it needs to reason when it's doing optimization. 
So first we're going to take a look at constant prop. Here's my beautiful function. So no one would actually write this. This isn't what you write. But for C++ programmers, we like abstractions. And we don't necessarily know how people are going to use our abstractions. Um, someone uses your abstraction and passes a lot of constants to it. You can end up with situations where it all compiles down to this. Where we're always going to hit the failure case. But because of the way you structured it, you use exceptions. So you decide to do this. Now, there's a sad thing uh, about compilers. Both, I, I'm actually not aware of any compiler that, that will look through this. Um, so here's, here's the code you get in this case. Um, the important thing to note is that we start by calling an exception. That's all we do. We store false into the exception, throw it do some cleanup, and then return that. And the reason this doesn't get optimized is because we can't propagate from the throw down to this landing pad and down to this load, essentially. Uh, compilers could. The, the problem is, is that there's we have to start embedding more information about the, the LLVM, it's not the LLVM, sorry, the C++ front end stuff, uh, specific stuff in the back end, and know what these functions do. Uh, like these are just external functions. They could do anything. This could go modify all memory. Um, but we need to, to think, it needs to reason that, oh no, that's not doing that. All this is doing is jumping to here. Uh, we also actually need to know that it's a bool and not something else. This is obviously a toy example, but how often in practice do we have constant expressions that cause an exception to be thrown if you, and are known to cause the exception to be thrown at the bottom? Really depends on your code. Oh, sorry. The question was uh, how often in practice do you hit this case? It, it really does depend on your code. Um, how, how often you use exceptions and um, how much you're tuning for performance, how much. You, um, you end up with constants versus if everything is being loaded from a file, like you're not going to hit this case. Did you see the nature of my question? If you're writing reasonable code, it would seem like you would know that what you're doing is going to wind up being a constant. And especially if you know that it's, I mean, and a one that's going to fail the except. It just seems such a, such a corner piece. So, so the problem is, oh, so, so the comment was, um, if you're writing the code, you should you know and that this is more of a corner case. Uh, especially because the constant is going to fail. I mean, you're writing. Yeah, especially because the constant's going to fail. Not just maybe, but at compile time. Like, whoa, what was I writing? What was I thinking? Yeah. So, did did either of you have direct responses to that? All right. So so, again, the case is you're not. So, I I imagine this coming up more in in a case where someone else wrote this library, super generic library that's designed to be able to handle all this dynamic data. But the way that you're using it, it all happens to be static. Mm -hmm. So the person that was writing the library wasn't thinking about this, this specific case. Okay. And uh, like, this probably doesn't come up that much. I mean, would it be the case that some other constant, like some other constant in is 13 would also not propagate into, into the, uh, uh, so can you repeat that? So you pointed out that like you, the the bool constant doesn't propagate into the landing pad. Yeah. But if if I, is thirteen had some other constant, like say a logger or something like that, that that also wouldn't something that's being logged in the catch that also wouldn't propagate. To the ah, pad. so the only thing that's not going to propagate is the exception, if I had um, uh, like, so if I had like int a equals get a in the try, and then in the catch, I had um, log a, that would propagate. Because, and that's why we track this control flow information, um, because we have this to unwind label three, 
or unwind to label three. Um, in here, uh, we, we set a value up here, and it will still be there here. And that's what all the EH tab tables are for, because they maintain all that state so that you don't lose it. Um, I think you were next. Yeah, so um, this is a case of someone using an exception for control flow. But is the point of this example that um, you've written something else that doesn't necessarily use an exception for control flow and it compiles down to this? Yeah, yeah. So the case is you didn't write this. The optimizer looked at your, your, your million lines of code, saw, I don't need any of this. Squish it all down, squish it down, squish it down, squish it down. Oh, look, you're fine. And, and you can actually hit cases um, like the compiler will track like partial bits. Like I know this bit is set, but this bit isn't set. And we know that 13 is whatever the representation is. Um, that like, oh, I know that one of those bits that needs to be set is actually 0. I don't know the rest of the value, but I know that it can't possibly be 13. So we're going to fail. Um, it's not, it, it's, it's, you get more complicated examples. Part of it was, I need to fit on slides and be explainable. So LVM has a pretty rich set of function attributes that you know, can capture this kind of thing. So, so is making this particular example work a matter of pretty straightforward matter of annotating some functions and having a front end put in some more stuff, or is it kind of more deeper legwork required to actually uh, see, see the right? Specifically stuff? here, there's there's no existing attributes that would do that. We need to specific we need like um, some pass, like some some of the constant pr propagation, maybe even like SCCP or or something, needs to reason about throws control flow, um, and and look through it, and then also the data flow from from here to to here or sorry to here, yeah. So yeah, and so it's this control flow here, and sorry, I was wrong to there, um, and we just don't do that. Um, it would take some work. I don't know the total amount of work it would take. I, I could annoy Chandler here and, and ask him how much work it would be. This is hard. You have to essentially teach. Uh, and this is only sorry. This is only really all like John. So this is only all you. You have to teach global value numbering. To like mark these memory locations as the same by reasoning about the semantics of CXA throw with particular personality routines. And particular types. And particular like types. that they're both bull. Right. Like that's just that's a really it'd be a lot of code. It'd be very, very special case. And you'd have to do it for every single dialect of exception handling. Uh, but you do it. It's it's doable. Um, so so the comment was, it's complicated. <laughs> um, it's doable but complicated. Um, did I? Okay, yeah. So so what if I used error codes here? Well, we're we're good at looking at control flow, so it goes to false. Um, and so the thing to learn here is that if you actually have a case where Failure is is not unlike, or, or failure is not unlikely, or is likely, um, and it's in a place that performance matters. Um, right now, don't use exceptions for that. Uh, in the future, maybe, but if failure is likely, don't use exceptions, right? Pretty much. Sometimes you don't know. I think maybe a better way to say it is if this failure pass. Even though exceptional, still has performance constraints on it. You, you may not want to use exceptions. All right, so because like there, 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 there are plenty of good reasons to, use, to not use exceptions if it's actually like not exceptional, right? But you might have performance constraints even on your exceptional error path. Mm -hmm. And if you do, exception handling may may make it hard to hit that performance constraint. Yeah. So the the comment was that if you have uh, performance constraints on your exceptional path then don't use exceptions there. Probably a good point to uh, plug my source having next that goes into exactly this. Cool. Vectorization. So I actually got some really interesting results out of this. But let's first take a look at my really cool multiply. I don't like multiplying by zeros, but only if it's the second part of the multiply. <laughs> <laughs> 
again, toy example. Um, but you, you could imagine a more, a more uh, a different case where you have some um, math function that you expect never, I'm never going to get uh, a, a negative here, or like to, I'm never going to get negative to my square root. And so you say, well, we're just going to throw, or we're going to return an error. And then we do simple loop, and we say, oh, if I get a negative one, I don't actually like negative ones. I wanted zero, which is the result you would have gotten anyway. Um, <laughs> and I'm actually like, LLVM doesn't see that. It's actually kind of interesting. Um, and it vectorizes. You get tons of IR. In fact, this, this goes out to, it, so I, uh, I compiled it for this laptop, which is like a 2013 MacBook Pro. Um, and you get, it, it goes to four wide and then unrolls it once. So you get two four wides. And it um, has no control flow. It, it turns this into uh, a select, like a, does some bit manipulation to get the right value out. So if we turn this into, we throw, like, <laughs> bad, don't give me zeros. <laughs> and we do this. Doesn't vectorize. Surprise. Still lots of IR. Um, who wants to guess the performance difference? 100x. More guesses? Any, any? It depends. Between 100 and 1,000. 10%. Uh, in the case, so, so the specific test was 120, so the, the buffers were 128 megabytes, and I filled it all with uh, ones. If there's zeros here, it's 40 times, 48 times slower. Um, but with all ones, it's only 10%. Um, the vector code we generate isn't amazing. <laughs> um, and this loop is actually really, really small. I, I, like, I, this might be hitting like loop decode um, buffer levels. Um, but so you can get surprises here. Um, especially when you're when you're not throwing. Now there are more complicated cases. Sadly, I, I can't show these on slides. They're they're huge, and the reason they're huge is because the way compilers reason about things. Uh, branches complicate analysis, um, and the reason they do that is some optimizations they only look within a single basic block. Um, now, if you actually compare the performance of, of exceptions over time with LLVM, um, it's and other compilers actually, it's gotten a lot better uh, because there's we've removed a lot of the places where we do this. Um, I actually to to try and f like uh, craft small cases. I, I went through LLVM and looked at all the places where we do basic block scans. Uh, basic block being the uh, all the instructions that uh, if you start at one, you're guaranteed to reach the last <laughs> unless something calls exit. Ignore that part. Uh, uh, basically, there's no control flow in there. And in uh, those cases have been decreasing. Um, there are still a few, and, and all of them almost uh, have little fix me's on them that say, hey, we should look past this, but we're not sure if this property holds or gets expensive. Um, but these are getting improved. Um, but there are some cases where you just can't, where if there is divergent control flow, um, the, the property you're looking for just no longer holds. And there's other cases where we've got n squared or worse optimizations, which are capped by, by how far back they can look, and especially how many basic blocks they'll look at. And so that's why it's hard to get small examples, is because you need larger code to hit these cases. Uh, one of the, the, the in, in researching for this, I, I took LVM, compiled with and without exceptions, and looked at the uh, the optimization stats. So LLVM can print like, oh, I did this optimization and this optimization this many times. So I looked at all those um, across, across LLVM and Clang. And you do get some interesting results. Um, uh, we actually generate a lot more code with exceptions turned on. And so you do a lot more optimization. But it's a lot more optimization to get back to where you started without exceptions. And uh, one of the interesting cases was actually loops, is that um, the extra branches, significant, uh, uh, um, 
in some cases, significantly reduced the amount of loop analysis we were able to do. Um, and we'll see how much, actually, I don't think I have the numbers for this. Sadly, or, or, or actually not sadly, um, but against what I predicted, um, for LLVM, it actually doesn't really matter. Um, turning on exceptions in LLVM was, I, I did limited testing on it, um, but it was basically, you couldn't perceive the difference. Um, perceive the difference in performance, um, which is, is partially because of the way LLVM is written and, and that compilers have just gotten better. Um, now, size, we'll, we'll take a look at size uh, in a bit. But when you do hit these cases, uh, the, the, the branches from the exceptions can hurt a lot. So let's look at space. So this is a, so some people only care about performance, others care about space. Some care about both, uh, particularly actually talking with, with people on Chrome. Um, they care a lot about how big their download size is. So how much space does it take up? Well, depends. Depends on the compiler. Depends on your code. Um, so let's let's measure some stuff. Um, let's take LLVM Clang. Turn on. Uh, so so Clang LLVM and Clang by default compile with F no exceptions, F no RTTI. So we turn them on, and here's the differences. These are sub uh, um, uh, colored by section. And the big dif biggest difference is text section, which is where all your code goes. Um, let's take a look at what else changed and, and analyze why, more importantly. Um, dynamic symbols. This one was actually surprising. And uh, we actually gained 13% in dynamic, like global symbols. Like, how is that possible? And it's actually because it, it's, a, it's a technical reason that doesn't really need to be there. It's because ELF can't tell the difference between a symbol that you need to um, just get the, the uh, to link a single object file and handle um, uh, com depths. So better explanation of that is you have function instantiations. Sorry, function template instantiations or just template instantiations in general. We know that those all get combined together. You don't get a separate instantiation in each thing. And the way those get combined together is they have a global symbol, and they have a tag, and the linker says, I already saw this tag, so I don't need to look at the other ones. And um, because when you have exceptions, you actually emit more destructors, and uh, less inlining happens because the code is more complicated, and so the inlining heuristics just end up inlining less. You actually end up. Uh, Having more calls, which don't um, w when you have a a, a uh, inline function or a, a template, you don't need to omit that if you inline at all, because like somebody else will have their own definition. But in the cases that that doesn't happen, we have to omit it, and then um, the linker doesn't know that nothing else is taking the address of that function, and we have address identity in, in C plus plus, so everybody has to agree on the address. And so we, we don't drop it. We could actually fix, we, we could add an ELF extension to get rid of most of this. Uh, some of it you won't get rid of because of the less inlining. Um, but a good chunk of it we could. Dynamic relocations was really surprising. It's like five times as many. Um, I looked at what they were, and it's all. Um, uh, I believe a bunch of this is actually from RTTI, uh, because I also had to enable RTTI to enable exceptions. And so a um, big chunk of this came from um, uh, the virtual tables for, for RTTI information. But the dynamic relocation table is actually pretty small, so it didn't actually have that big of an impact in total size. Uh, text, which is actually a really important one uh, because of caches and, and uh, uh, page tables. If you grow your text size, you can end up bringing, needing to bring, have more cache misses and more, more t uh, uh, page table misses. And the reason for this is, is almost all landing pads 
Some of it is, is we were able to do less analysis, and some of it is that those extra branches actually cause more code to be generated even in the happy path. Um, and here's another place where, where I'm actually sad with LLVM is that as of GCC 8, so the most recent GCC, um, they actually take the landing pads and put them in a separate section and, and shove them off to a different place in code. So they are truly in cold, cold code. Um, everything prior to that, they go at the end of the function, but not somewhere else. So you don't get it as densely packed. Um, even with GCC, though, they still have to emit a little bit of code because it needs to jump to the, um, it needs to insert a little trampoline down to the, the real code. Um, so this, this could shrink a bit, but your text is always going to be bigger. And then your exception frames grow because they need to be more precise. And uh, sometimes you end up having more things to track because code gen happens differently. You have to save more registers. They grow. And then the exception tables only exist with um, exceptions. And it's like half the size of the EH frames because they don't exist otherwise. And you may say, not a fair comparison. Who thought that was not a fair comparison of exceptions versus, versus stuff? Everyone thinks it's fair? <coughs> Yeah, yeah. You don't use exceptions. You enable them and didn't use them. Um, that's true, but guess what? Yeah, so, so it doesn't use that. Uses expected. Um, but error handling is rare in LLVM. We don't like it's not exceptions or errors. It's exceptions or nothing. Um, most functions don't fail, or if they do fail, we terminate. Um, and a big part of that is because we don't handle out of memory. Uh, because both because it's in, on some platforms not even possible. And what, what are we going to do when we're out of memory? We're going to print, hey, I'm out of memory, <laughs> bye. The classic thing you do when you're out of memory is you, you have a reserved store. And so you don't need any of the exceptions or anything. You just have the new handler. And when you run out of memory, you give back the memory that you reserved for that case. You save your client data and you exit. We don't have anything to save. And you don't have to worry, but, but that's what one would yeah. do. Yeah. I, mean, I just want, don't want to say, in all cases, there's nothing to do, because yeah. sometimes there is something but to you, do. But you can actually do that even, well, if your platform uh, has that capability, even with no throw new, you can do that. You can set a um, out of memory handler. That's what I'm saying. It has nothing to do with exceptions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. In fact, it worked in C a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Uh, the comment being that uh, if you have data to save, uh, a thing you can do even without exceptions is um, set a memory allocation failure handle and uh, save your data there. Yeah, it's called the new handle. Oh. Yeah. But so you actually go and look at LVM, and, I, and I, I've worked at LVM for a long time, and then I actually went and sampled to make sure that I wasn't just like forgetting about the error handling. Um, uh, we, so we have, we have a verifier that doesn't even run at... at um, uh, in release builds, but when you um, when, when we so we, we have error checking when we read in bit code, and um, when we read in the files, but that's a very small part of our, our code. Most of it is doing analyses, analyses, and and transforming bit code. And if you give it the wrong thing, that's a programming error, is how we view it. And so we we have asserts, but they're turned off in in in, in um, release. And so if something sneaks to release, yeah, we crash. Um, but why did you write your code that way? Why did you write bad code? Don't do that. Um, and so that's the way. And so that's why we don't have errors or error handling. And so why, when, when, most, when you have this kind of code where most of your code doesn't have errors, that um, <clears throat> It's not really a trade-off, or it's not really a, uh, um, it, it is a more fair comparison. Um, but we'll actually look at a more fair comparison. Or, um, yeah. So sadly, I cannot pronounce this person's name. Uh, but they wrote a blog post, 2016, comparing the size of uh, C-style error handling versus C++ with exceptions and C++ with no exceptions. And in all cases, no errors actually happen. This is just the overhead and size of, um, of, of exceptions versus 
error codes. So the way they did this was they generated 1,000 C++ functions at each of, in their own translation unit, and 1,000 C functions, and then compares with F no exceptions and stuff. And, um, and so I have their um, blog link down here. Uh, these are the two things it generated for C++. It generates over there. And for C, it generated this. And you run the benchmarks, and you basically get this. That C code's a little bit bigger, C++ accepting handling, a bit smaller, and then no exceptions the smallest. And so, uh, like I said earlier, they, they get to the analysis step, and they say, I, I don't really know why. Maybe this, maybe that. Um, Let's actually answer why. So I went and looked, looked at all like what codes generated, and obviously no except the smallest because there is no error handling. So the overhead you're paying on both those other cases just doesn't exist. C, the, why, so why is C larger than CPPH? Sorry, yeah. Because they actually check all of their return code instead of missing five or six. But so the error handling, so, so the exception checks all the error codes. It's like error codes. It checks all the errors. I, I, I'm saying in, in real code. Oh, in real code. It has five of them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there's actually a couple of reasons. Um, if, we, if we go back and look at it, um, they're passing in this char and then passing it down to everything and then actually loading from it and checking on everything. And so that load uh, and the, the um, registers taken up take some for that. Um, there's a case where Clang and GCC refused to merge two identical basic blocks. Like, I was confused by that. There, there might, like, I might have missed something in there, but uh, in the, ex the exception case, they do get merged because if we go and look, all of these functions can share the same landing pad. There's only one destructor. It, like, doesn't change which destructors need to get called. If you had other functions in here, you would add more landing pads. And in the C++ example, uh, D is on, it must be stack allocated. So it's on the stack. And so you have a register already. You have the, the, the stack pointer register, which is pointing to it. And in C, it actually gets allocated. And so along with errors, uh, along with those from errors, you, you get registers allocated for all these things. And it ends up using call these save registers and adds a bunch of stack manipulation and EH frame entries for those extra registers. So because of the particular way that it was written, um, it ends up being bigger. What we were saying, what are exceptions? So what is this? What is C style error, hand error handling? Um, it's explicit control flow and thread local data. <coughs> error no is thread local data. So if we change this into a more C example, and we actually use our thread local data. So if you get an error, we're just going to set the thread local to something. And return, we're going to reserve one of our return values for negative one and check that and call it. And this is actually much more film, uh, similar to all the C APIs I've seen, like, like C and Windows API, POSIX API. This is actually much more what that code looks like. And if you compare this, it ends up being smaller. So why is it smaller? Turns out tables are bigger than a branch. Um, if you look at what code gets generated for that check, it's just three bytes. You compare and branch. For each call site in the table-based approach, it is minimum of nine bytes in tables. And it actually ends up being more, but some of the data is shared. Um, and they, they both require cleanup blocks. Uh, the cleanup blocks for the C site inhaling are slightly smaller because it doesn't have to um, deal with getting the exception and, and um, extract the information out of the exception and checking types and stuff. Um, so that's size. So, um, and I was actually kind of surprised because I would, I, I kind of expected that um, C code full of error handling would be larger than the tables. Um, but it turns out that it, depending on the complexity of your, your C style error handling, it, it actually ends up being smaller. Um, now, this is a synthetic example, and this is like a worst case example. And but. so now let's talk about a bit more interesting performance. So I work with PlayStation, and we benchmark our games a lot, so I had easy access to something to test. Um, so we uh, tested one of our games, 
with and without exceptions. And much, uh, yeah, so in games don't generally use exceptions. In fact, our <laughs> compiler ships with them turned off. If you want exceptions, you have to pass f exceptions. And like LLVM, games tend not to error. Uh, it's OK if a pixel's wrong. It's OK if things are missing. Um, and, and it's like a programming or packaging error if, if you didn't do the right thing. So, so the places that errors happen is um, uh, file I.O. at a low level. Uh, you don't really want to you don't generally propagate that up very high. And networking. Like you care if, if you drop the network. Like just if you crash in that case, uh, people are going to return your game if you can. Um, and every, like pretty much everywhere else, including the, the, the APIs, like the graphics APIs. Like in OpenGL, everything returns an error. But you can actually ignore the errors. Um, like it's totally safe to do that for, for most functions. Um, and they're specified as, oh, if you gave me an invalid value, then I just like do this or do something or some, or like an unspecified thing gets written to the screen. And that's, that's OK, because that's a programming error. Uh, yeah. So I want to ask you, that's, that you just hit on what I was asking. An error in the sense that we're talking about is you try to open a file and it doesn't open. That's, that's not an error. That's, that's not a, an exception. That's, I tried to do it, you asked, and it was impossible. Um, then there are other kinds of things where I'm trying to take the square root of a number, and I don't intend to pass in minus 1. But if I do, that's not an error in the conventional sense. That's yes. going to be the context. Yes. So what you just said is, I defined that if you pass in minus 1 to square root, I'll do something, but I won't crash. Is that what you're talking about? Do you put it in your statement um, and check it? There are different cases. In some cases, um, it'll just be like, I'll do the wrong things. Other cases, it will be, I just crash. So, but it sounded to me like you went out of your way to say. I, I was describing the OpenGL API. Okay. Uh, in, in that specific case, they don't crash. They just do something else. So they don't crash. They don't necessarily tell you what they're going to do, but they do tell you what is appropriate. And then if yes. you do something else, they won't crash, but it'll be something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's the point of that. Yeah. Like. Yeah, like like the, the exception here is is pointers, like if you uh, um, and memory, like if you ask it to allocate memory for for something and it errors and you don't check and then you try to access it, like that's bad. The thing is, you're well, by by making sure that it doesn't crash, you're putting in extra if statements that if properly called they would never need. So you're yeah. maximizing your code and going to do something that's not what was intended, which sounds pretty bad. Uh. Yeah. There's not always extra ifs. Right? Yeah, and so, so the comments, so so the comments here were that um, if you're you're checking for cases and then just not uh, for cases that are out of contract, but you don't want to signal that, and you're you're still adding checking even though you're not doing anything with it. I think that sums up. Yeah, you're doing nothing. Like, yeah. oh, it's out of range. I won't do anything. Yeah, and then uh, uh, Tony commented that um, in those cases. Um, it may not actually even need the check. It's just that the way it's written happens to fall out differently. Right. So you pass in minus one for a loop that's expecting a positive number, and you get minus one. It doesn't do anything. No check. Just no. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and it depends. Like in the actual game code, you'll get cases where it'll just crash. Um, but some of the lower APIs, they like being nicer. Potentially costs. nicer. Yeah. It costs. If we wanted to put that in standard ease, I think we would say that the former function ha has a range of inputs where it has unspecified behavior, and the latter is undefined behavior. Yeah, or an unspecified value, maybe. But yeah, so, so, so the comment was that we want to put it in standard terminology. One has <coughs> undefined, like truly undefined behavior, and, and the other has, has an unspecified uh, behavior or unspecified value, or like implementation defined, or. Various things. Um, I mean, as a flavor, uh, if, <coughs> if you give it a texture and you specify the wrong color space, you'll get something. On yeah, the like you'll draw to the but screen. It ain't gonna be the texture you thought. It's it not gonna be pretty. Unspecified thing on the screen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 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 I guess the main point is that these functions all have narrow contracts. Would be the term, right? Yeah. So, so the majority of our stuff has, has a very narrow contract. Um, so the way I measured this was uh, we measure CPU time per frame, so how much CPU, not GPU, time was spent 
uh, in a steady state. So after all the, the file I.O. has happened and the character is just sitting there staring at a hallway or stairway. Um, and we actually have very low noise on, on this. Uh, so this is PS4. Uh, the way that this, this game works, um, it has, so the way the PS4 works in general is you have six threads that are dedicated to you. The um, scheduler will, will never interrupt you unless you yield. Um, or you uh, assign multiple threads to it. And um, then you have a half core, but that one doesn't really matter for this case. And then the game will schedule onto those threads using lightweight threading um, or, or fibers. And so we, you actually do end up with pretty low noise. And so what this actually represents is this is the uh, kernel density estimate of the frame times using, uh, I forget the name of the, the, the bandwidth filter, but there's a bandwidth filter. Basically, this is, this is a histogram. It's a smooth histogram, um, but that's it, basically what it is. And so here's frame time. We're, we're actually down at like, yeah, which is, you have 16.6 or 16.3. Do you remember? Yeah, so 16.6 repeating. So we're hitting 60 frames a second. Um, and we're actually way down here. We, we actually have quite a bit of headroom here. Um, but this is uh, not necessarily the worst case CPU time. And then there's also the time uh, from when you submit your job to the GPU and how much time it has to finish the frame, which extends it out. Um, so, so you do have a very limited budget. But if you actually look at these, these numbers, the difference between these numbers are really small. And if you actually like, take the average of these values and compare it, it's, it's a bit less than 1% overhead. Um, uh, and, and it's pretty repeatable, um, but there, there's not much difference here. Um, and this actually really surprised me. Because um, I've uh, done stuff in the past, and by past a while ago, um, compilers seem to have gotten a lot better at this. Um, haven't gotten much better in code size, uh, for exceptions, but, but performance. And, and part of this is because when, when you do performance tuning, you care about inlining a lot. And if you have your functions external, uh, they don't get inlined unless you're doing LTO. But this, this was a non-LTO build. Um, and so when things are inlineable, the compiler can actually see through them. And Clang does a really good job, actually, of implying um, basically no except. It's not actually no except, but it's basically that uh, this, uh, this chain of function, this function and everything it calls, there's no exceptions. And so it just says, we're going to take this from that invoke thing with all the branches you saw and just turn it into a call. And so when you've, when you've been heavily optimized just for inlining, you, you also happen to not have external calls in your hot code. And so I, I was a bit surprised, but, but a bit less also. So, so that gets us on to what, what, are, what are the true costs? Um, so we had potentially dead branches. So potentially dead in that if you actually never throw an exception, then that's a dead branch. That, that exceptional <laughs> edge is dead, because you don't care about that, because you don't throw. Um, and they can be hard to remove. And that branches do impede optimization. Um, Compilers are getting better here, but, but there are cases they can't handle. And that code that doesn't have errors uh, pays, this pays this cost in size and performance. Um, but as we saw, depending on the way your code is, uh, the performance can actually be not that bad. So, so for people that are actually not using exceptions, I do encourage you to, to try enabling exceptions and see what hit you get. Now, the choice to actually use exceptions in your program could be a whole different thing. Like, if we try to do this in LLVM, it's, we have 10, no, like almost 20 years of history of not using exceptions in the code, and you just try to turn it on, the amount of programming errors you'd get, the amount of cases where we, like, we're, we're not, we don't have the strong exception guarantee in all these cases, because we don't write our code like that. Well, it's not even that. If you don't write your code to be exception safe, and that requires a mindset, the code will just not work. Yeah. So, so the comment was that if if you're if it's you're not it's not a little it's not the way you just said it. It's like well, it's not strongly exception safe. I could live with that. 
It's not like that at all. What it is is the code will absolutely not work, just will not work, because the difference between writing exception-safe code and non exception safe code is so pervasive, and people that aren't aware of exceptions will <coughs> write exception non safe code by default. I'm just, it's just, I don't yeah. know what you just stated with the right amount of... Yeah, so, so, so John wants me to increase the, the, uh, the, the warning here. It's like uh, a storm warning, <laughs> not, not a watch. We're, we're going up from, from yeah, storm warning trout. We've got like hurricane levels here of, of you have a long history of, of code not written for it, uh, trying to throw, trying to like add exceptions in there. Like no one has that mindset. The code was written with that mindset um, and you change your code. And this is actually also part of the cost of exceptions is that, um, <laughs> and the one, the one example that everyone always wants someone to go do is, take a big uh, project and rewrite it with exceptions, which is, which we, or without, which would be an amazing project to do if anyone has a few years free time. Um, and um, when you do have to rewrite your code to, to handle exceptions, you do have things where, like std vector, um, we do different things depending on if it's no, if it's no accept or not no accept. And you end up writing your code differently, depending on where you can have exceptions and where you can't. Um, and so, what's what's the fix here? Um, what what can we do to? So we we have proposals or not really proposals here yet, but but in the committee, people want to to there there have been suggestions of standardizing uh, FDO exceptions. Um, doubt that would ever make it through, um, but. What can we do to, to reunify C++ really? So we have, there's a ton of libraries out there that only compile with FNO exceptions. Don't work with exceptions at all. Um, and if you have exceptions, like if, 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 it's, if it uses any of your types and your types need exceptions, then it just doesn't work with them. And so how do we, how do we bring these back together? Because uh, we really do currently have a, a uh, fractured C++ community. We have the exceptions people and the no exceptions people. And sometimes they can share stuff, but cases they can't. Um, so part of the fix I'm actually going to say is uh, improve compilers. Um, there, there's, a, there's a thing that makes me very sad in playing uh, where uh, you could say uh, one, one of the answers here actually is throw no accept on everything. Um, then you don't, like, it just gets rid of the branches and you're happy. Uh, problem is, is that uh, Clang doesn't handle no accept very well. Uh, the semantics of no accept are that if an exception would propagate outside of this function, then you call std terminate. And so the way Clang implements this is it um, actually puts a call to std terminate inside your code. The way that GCC implements this is that there's a little bit of the spec of the um, GCC exception, uh, sorry, the GCC accept tables, um, where it says that if you have an, uh, if you, if you have a, um, a certain kind of entry for this region of code, then if it gets here, it'll call std terminate. And that could be fixed. It's just we might need like some representation change or some better pattern matching, um, but it's some work that needs to be done. And uh, part of the problem, so, so I've been doing a bunch of research on this and finding a bunch of places in the compiler where we miss things, uh, like the examples earlier. And like I actually want to go and fix these, but um, uh, at my job, we don't care about exceptions. Like we ship with them off. None of our users, none of our first parties use it. Most of our third parties don't use it. If I go and say, "Oh, we're, I can improve the performance of this," and they're like, "So, so what? No one cares." Um, so someone needs to fix it. Um, why did GCC and Clang do it differently? And it seems like the way you describe Clang is the right way to do it. Uh, how, uh, so the way the way just Clang does it is wrong. But, but, but how, how did you understand the reason, it? The reason, because it makes sense to me that if something is going to terminate, you want to put the code for terminating in one place. Because once something's decorated with no accept, you never want an exception to, to escape. And so putting the thing that catches and, and terminates in, in front of every client is a bad idea. In other words, once something says no accept, the client can rely on no exception getting to here. So, so the... the, the um... Um, effect of, um, actually the effect of playing in GCC is not the same, um, because 
I, I actually didn't explain this, and I, and I can explain it a bit here. When you unwind, what happens? Um, G, the, the, the GCC implementation, or the, the Itanium ABI, there's actually two phases. You first walk up the stack, not changing any program state, until you find where you're going to um, throw the exception, or, or catch the exception. And the reason it does that is that in case it needs to call std terminate, you have the program context of where the exception originated from, which is much better for debugging. Sure. Um, and the way GCC implements no accept, uh, you'll hit this case and you'll have you'll know where it threw from uh, without doing any unwinding. Then there's the second stage where once it finds where it's going to do something, then it goes up the stack, calling cleanups, calling destructors at each level until it gets there. And so in the way Clang implements it, it actually will walk up the stack and then get here and then calls to terminate. When it, when it sees that it's not allowed to throw through. Yeah, it goes that's all the, the way, way up. It was intended by the people, when, when it was originally designed, the idea is you didn't want the flow of control to be able to go back through something that claimed it was known. So I, I'm, not, I'm not fully understanding uh, what you're saying. Um, the, the, the observable semantics there's a security. Other hole. than, so, well, no, no, it's the observable semantics other than what destructors are called, um, other than if the, the stack is unwound, is, um, is the same. Sorry, yeah, Chanley. I, I, think, I think the confusion here is uh, not, neither implementation unwinds past no exception. Yeah, they don't unwind past it. Right, like they're, they're, they're never going past it. Clang unwinds to the no accept frame and then calls to terminate. GCC calls to terminate immediately without any unwinding. Yeah. GCC's approach to this is strictly more efficient and completely conformed. Is it conformed? Yes. It is unspecified whether or not the stack is unwound when you call uh, to terminate or unexpected, but that doesn't exist anymore. But it seems like it would be done in a nice procedure to tell the stack. It would be. So, so I do want to I do want to repeat some of these comments. Uh, the, uh, the the summation from 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 Chandler was that they they both do not propagate outside the no accept function. The only difference is if the stack is unwound or not. And then the comment was that it would be nice to to know where you had the throw if you call to terminate. Right. And then I think you were saying. Yes. I think I mean the I think I think it would be more better to see where the throw was on the the patch that can exist or something. I don't know yeah. where you're going. So so I think Chandler has a direct answer? Yeah, but the point is like I understand that people make this mistake. Yeah. But it is a mistake to rely on destructors being run when you throw an exception that calls to terminate. They do not. That is true for all of the ways that you can reach the terminate. If you throw a second exception within a destructor, while unwinding an exception, and that calls to terminate, guess what? It doesn't continue to run destructors. In fact, because it can't, because you're in one, right? Like, and so part of designing exception safe code is both being prepared for the unwinding to run some of your destructors and not relying on one on unwinding for critical cleanup when your program is terminating, which is why they're terminate handles. And we can debate whether this API is good and how frequently programmers remember this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but like that's what it says. And, and there are a bunch of reasons why you can't rely on destructors running if an exception ends up calling to terminate. There are a bunch of ways you can get to that point, and some of them <coughs> functionally have no mechanism to run the destructors. So the comment was, <laughs> um, don't rely on destructors running when you're calling or when std terminate is being called. Right. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say that it's actually, like, my opinion is it's much easier to debug because, you know, in a good case, you get a core. And what do you want? You want as little code to run after the fatal condition is detected as possible because that would be the annoying thing. Just, just yeah. I was, like, what, what is the, the terminal thing? The throw or the fact that it's locked back and calls 
the walking, the walking does not unwind. This is yeah, because this, this is just, there's two phases there. So first of all, the comment was that it's easier to debug when less happens. Sorry, it's easier to debug when less happens after the, the error. And that um, the, it's, it's two phases. There's the search phase and then the actual unwind phase. And this calls terminate during the search phase. And this is not due to no except. If you throw for main and miss, you have the same yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to add something to that. So the, the other thing that can be used to fix this is that if I do have, so, so I've got my code that doesn't do errors um, at all. And so I know everything could be marked no accept. But um, so you, you, I go and tell my game programmers, OK, we, we can enable exceptions, and you can have exceptions in these places. But to make sure that you're not having any performance or size impact, you get to go add no accept to, to hundreds of thousands of functions. And, and they're going to stare at me like I'm crazy. Like, like, go away. It's not worth it. More than not worth it, it's really bad. Because for, for narrow contracts, all kinds of things are prevented. You define undefined behavior by putting no accept on. That's, a, that's all. You, you what? You define undefined behavior. If you put no accept on the bracket operator, things that would otherwise be undefined behavior become partially defined. Uh, so, so the comment was that, that if you put uh, no accept on something, the things that would be undefined behavior become defined. Um, well, not completely undefined behavior. Or become not completely undefined. Uh, what what case are you thinking of here? Bracket operator prevented. Um, it's undefined to call it outside the valid range of the vector. Putting no except doesn't change that. It actually does because if you call it outside the valid range before anything could happen, now one thing can't happen. It can't throw past the thing because it says no except. So you partially define the behavior. You haven't completely defined it, but you've taken something it, off the table that's really important. So. So the comment was that, for example, if you put it on uh, a vector operator brackets, that uh, you're saying that a, a valid thing to do would no longer be to throw. Um, uh, so, so this is true, but this isn't going to hurt optimization. I don't know what you mean by that. It's going to hurt the, the ability to have a contract and, a, and, a, and an a, a assertion handler and the ability to deal with it, especially during tests. So, so it could hurt those cases, but those aren't the cases my users care about. My users care about, care about testing. <laughs> Te <laughs> testing, <laughs> testing games is an interesting thing. Um, <laughs> we, we, we have a department of QA people for that, that, that we have That's, like. That sounds classical. It's it, it, it is terrible, but. but, um, <laughs> but it's like classical, not terrible. Um, it's but terrible yeah. too. So, but, but no except um, really doesn't in inhibit optimization. Um, you can construct cases, but you would have to like fail at analyzing things. Like I, I looked into this a lot. Um, uh, no except doesn't really harm optimization at all. So what no except does is it adds code in places where you can't see all the way through. You say, well, I don't know what my body is, so I'm going to have to put terminate to terminate here because I put a no except. That's so, so but that's only because Clang's lame. Um, okay. uh, the other case is if you don't put no except, then somebody has to assume if they can't see the entire body that something will that, throw yeah. and they have to lay down the code. So putting no except adds code and takes away code in different situations. You must no except in a proper implementation will always remove code. Interesting. Unless it could otherwise already prove that it wouldn't throw. It, it will never add code. Like it does in Clang right now, but that's a bug. Interesting. OK. Um, uh, we had some other hands, but did they go down? OK. So, so let's fix no accept. Um, there's actually a really easy way to do this. Like I just want scoped no accept. <laughs> like, Oh, yes, and, and yeah. <laughs> no exceptions in STID 2. But that's OK, because STID 2 is dead. <laughs> Don't you want no except false or no except true? So no except by itself yes. on a function just means, it means no except true. Sorry, yeah, no except true. That's what it means by default. Um, but I want to be able to make no except blocks. That's like this whole region of code, everything in it is no except. And then with that, I can go to my, my people and say, um, you can have exceptions. And if you ever have any, any performance issues, or if you have just code that you know that, you don't, that you're not throwing exceptions out of it uh, after we fix the compiler, uh, then just put, put this around it, and you're good. Can we put context for that? 
<laughs> sure, sure. I, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, also inline and static and, and register because, I don't know, because you feel like it. Um, yeah. Uh, th there are some cases I would need to think about more. Like I don't know if this would cause any um, like maintenance issues or any actual like uh, conflict, conflict uh, definition confliction issues. Um, so I need to look at this more before actually like proposing this. Um, but basically, what I want. Um, and so so I actually learned a lot working uh, setting up this talk. Um, and because uh, previously I, I was in the camp of did you have a did you have a joke? Yeah, for for statements, you already have a noise check block. You can define noise check parameters and you can call them. Yeah. <coughs> um, uh, yes, so I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, originally, I, I really did want a, a no exceptions mode for, for C++ um, because of how widespread it is. Um, I was actually surprised by, by this room, but I, I guess I'm not surprised. This is C++ now. Like, we're, we're a self-selecting group. Um, but I, I do think that, that most of our problems can be solved by uh, improving compilers and making it easier to apply no except. Um, it would be great if we could get some company. Like, so, so the, like who's the largest contributors to LLVM? We have like Apple and, and Google and, and Sony's. Well, uh, uh, Sony has a lot of contrib contributions, and, and there's lots of other companies. Um, but I don't know of any of the major contributors that care about exceptions. So we have a problem. Uh, we have work that needs to be done, and, and no companies that are, that are going to fund it, basically. Uh, I don't know how to solve that problem, but, but we do have a path forward, I think. Um, are, there, are there any other questions? And they all mostly explain the mechanisms at a level necessary for the programmer to understand and to write the correct code. But can you recommend any books or articles that explain with the same kind of depth what actually happens from the point of view of the uh, instructions generated by the compiler dependencies and from the point of view of the data structures generated by those instructions upon try, upon catch, upon throw, upon yeah. So, so the, the question was, um, do I have any resources about um, more details? Because I went into some details, but, but I did gloss over a bit, um, uh, and so, so even more in depth. So there is not a lot of like, even documentation about how this works. Um, uh, part of the documentation is go read the source code of, of GCC and, and Clang. Um, however, uh, Ian Lance Taylor has a series of articles about basically all of the, the ABI on Linux, and it includes this. Um, I, uh, I don't remember his URL, but it's just Ian Lance Taylor. Um, so he has uh, both on. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I actually have. So is it? Yeah, Compiler Explorer. So I actually had some examples up in Compiler Explorer. Oh, here's the, here's the vectorization code. It's, it's beautiful. Um, so. Uh, Ian Lance Taylor, yeah, uh, yeah, and here's the ones I actually just visited them recently. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so he he has a lot of posts. This is actually back 2011. Um, Let it see the, the name. Oh, sorry. Oh, can I zoom in on that? Uh, yeah. The name is is in the title of the page, right? If you go back to the page, you'll see the Zoom in. Yeah, that worked too. Yeah. Also, one place where a piece of this is documented reasonably well is in particular ABI documentation. Yeah. So, so if you like, look at the ABI, there's a section that explains some parts. Yeah. I, I already closed all my browser tabs, so nothing would interrupt me. But there's um, HP actually has a, a document that has like a, a nice little graph uh, of how things work and how things unwind. Um, yeah. So 
<clears throat> my experience has been that uh, except using systems that are well designed, um, involve throws and catches relatively rarely. And there's typically a large uh, number of stack frames between the throw and the catch when there is a catch in play. And when I've tried to time you know, relatively simple functions, like so let's say you've got a simple controller function that reads from the sensor, which may fail because the sensor will do a little thing, and then it tells the uh, actuator what to do, and that may fail for the same reason. So if what you do there is branch and look at an error code and possibly let me out, or you just let the exception get propagated through. In other words, you've got an exception neutral function, right? Only providing the basic uh, exception statement for each one. Then that will tend to be, for that simple case with just you know like 20 lines of code mm -hmm. and two branches, that was about 10% faster um, uh, with exceptions than with error code. And I'm wondering if you did any um, kind of, uh, if you're able to find any examples where you could see like, um, the cost of propagating an exception versus the cost of propagating the same information as now. Yeah, so the, the person who, whose name I couldn't pronounce, they also had a later post um, about e exactly that case. Um, they did a similar synthetic benchmark of deep hierarchies and what is my, what, uh, how, how deep is the hierarchy and how often do I throw? And they, they found a similar thing. Um, uh, I don't, I didn't uh add that because I, I didn't really have enough time to go into that also and and the main point was that like i'm not propagating things everywhere everything's either local or no no errors um but i think it's interesting to look into i i also like uh, i need to look deeper into to his results there or, or, or their results because i you're doing a a, a um a, a binary lookup table at every level and looking through, like you're pointer chasing all over the place. Um, I don't really get how that could be faster, but. Um, okay, so all the ways we structure our code to be exception neutral, so we don't care whether you build an F exception mode or not, and then link us into whatever else you're building, is you acquire a resource to do some code, and then you have to have a clean as an exception app where you might catch dot dot dot. Do your cleanup and throw. The alternative is we always use a guard object to acquire the resource so the destructor always does the yeah. cleanup. So we avoid the try cat. Are they neutral as far as the cost of this would be concerned? Does one actually produce slightly more or less efficient code in practice? Uh, they sh um, so this is comparing the cat dot 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 rethrow in the end. Avoiding it thing, we're thinking that's a bad oh, thing. Yeah, that's uh, it, it, if you are, so, so the question was, um, uh, try catches versus guard objects, and which is going to be faster. And um, so I haven't measured that specifically, but the code gen you'll get, like, it enables you to compile with f no exceptions, because like f no exceptions in compilers right now, if you have a throw statement, like, it, it errors out. I would prefer that they, like, call terminate or something. But, um, uh, you sh if you compile with actual exceptions, you'll get a single call to the destructor, to the, to the guard object. And if you have exceptions, you'll get multiple for the, the, the landing pads and stuff. So uh, I think using guard objects is, is a good way if you want to be able to compile under both. I have a response. To response. That. So we have, we have a code base that uses exceptions, um, but we have specific instances in hot paths, particularly in some lock constructs, um, where we pull guard objects out um, because they're mutate, they mutate some state, um, and we put catch dot 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 because that actually shortens the happy path a little tiny bit. I mean, this is and actually I don't think I think the measurement was simply there's fewer instructions, um, not that the performance is different. So guard objects actually have a cost, and I actually think this is a place where the language can improve too, because um, you the guard we can talk about that later. <laughs> There might be ways to make guard objects less expensive. So the comment was that in, in his code base, they, they switched from doing guards to doing catch dot 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 and then calling unlock? So or, within some performance critical code. OK, in, in some per performance critical code to, to uh, get to rid of? The number of instructions. To reduce the number of instructions. To shorten the instruction path. Okay. I'd be very interested to hear if it really is a performance problem because the entire Bloomberg infrastructure code base does not do try catch and throw in, in my area. And instead, we use 
this, this guard approach, which we call exception agnostic. And that way it works in every, everywhere all the same way. We don't have to worry about whether exceptions are enabled or not. Yeah, so the comment was that in, in John's uh, environment, they, they only use guard objects. They don't, uh, and uh, an exception agnostic approach. And want, wanted to know more about the performance stuff. Uh, so I, I was curious which part of this is handled by live online. Because I know that Clang and C are perfectly capable of using the same one. Uh, yes. And having different strategies kind of confused me. So, so the, the comment was which part of this is lib unwind? Um, and if you look, there will be a call to. Um, so most of the stuff is is um, lib CXX ABI or, or whatever your your C++ ABI library is. Uh, there is one thing unwind resume. So all of the underscore unwind functions are uh, lib unwind, and lib unwind actually calls into the the personality function, which is defined in your 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 C++ ABI, and so they are ABI compatible because everybody uses lib unwind. And also, the ABIs are all, all, we all share the same interface for the ABIs. But that's where the split is. I just wanted to note that there's actually a few other scenarios that one might not want to use exceptions in or that were not discussed here, like uh, determinism or uh, kernel development with signal semantics or the RAM footprint if you have a very tiny amount of RAM. I mean, if the emergency buffer is 40K and you only have 16, then you cannot turn on exceptions. Uh, and I would also like to note that there's a lot of like dark matter programmer people in like the automotive industry who would really like to use exceptions, but they can't pass even sort of basic safety guarantees because they don't know how long interrupt service speed is going to be off during unwinding. And if they don't turn them off during unwinding, you can have multiple things unwinding on top of each other and things like that. Yeah, so the, the, the comment was that there, there are other environments um, that can't use exceptions, especially when you're, you're resource constrained or, or hard real time. Um, and, and for those, um, I think you do need a different exceptions implementation. And I believe that Herb um, actually had his thing, which is, is, I don't know if you need to standardize anything special. Uh, a perfectly valid implementation of exception handling is to turn it into error codes. Just under the cover, you return two things. Like it's still thread. It's it's implicit control flow plus thread local state. Anything you can, any way you can implement that is a valid implementation. I think there are some. I'm aware of the standard it is the proposal. I, I think there are some changes that do need to be made, and there are some that would maybe increase efficiency. Um, like you know, you could do that. It would be slow if you had uh, you know some uh, you know new ABI in some place or something. <coughs> then it could go way faster. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's not just a quality implementation issue, but I also know, like to your point, that nobody's uh, paying money for this. I know that uh, one of the German automakers is paying money for this, and I can't say which, <laughs> but uh, they're not talking about it. Uh, over there. If you want to hear more about that, again, I think that's where the mic wants to go. Damn it, now I have to go to your talk. Or, um, <laughs> the, the way forward, that's right. another alternative. Were you gonna? No, okay. Sorry, I'm just. Uh, uh, the some of the articles that I recently was reading say that modern compilers can generate the code handling exception in such a way that if the exception is very prone, then the performance cost of the exception is zero. On the other hand, a couple years ago, I heard that. Uh, Walter Bright, the designer of programming language, said that zero cost exception is a myth. What's your opinion about that? Uh, so, I mean, we showed here. It's not a, a, one more slide. Like, zero cost exceptions in, in the happy path uh, under certain constraints. Um, oh, this was the case that we could actually fix. Um, it's hard to, like, getting absolute zero where the exact instructions that you execute 
is the same, I don't think is, is, is possible in all cases. Like, I, like that's provably not possible. Um, uh, simply because you, you have more exit blocks in, in that you have places where previously you would not throw a destructor, where like where you have uh, in RVO where you're not throwing a destructor um, because you're just constructing something, where now if you have exceptions, you are adding destructors. And that increases the amount of state you need to keep. Um, and so I don't think you can get zero. I think you can get very close to zero. But is it possible to do some exception preparation work in the beginning and during the run in a loop to have a zero cost, zero performance cost of exceptions? Uh, so so for, for loops, it, it actually adds additional exit blocks. And so there are optimizations that can get inhibited. Um, so, so we are over time, but uh, you had one more? There was also is that. Uh, I mean, yeah, you can be cheaper than error codes. Like, you don't, you don't have the branches. And if, if everything's, uh, depending on what the compiler can see, what it can do, um, yeah, it can, be, it can be cheaper. Chandler's staring at me. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs>